I'm going to need to be talking about a number of interconnected and interlocking topics today, all with the objective of arguing, explaining that whilst humans are certainly capable of reason and rationality, we have large-scale obstacles in the way of achieving a rational perspective, where rationality is defined as a worldview consistent with the best of our understanding, independent of how that understanding makes us feel about the things we seek to understand. And this video touches upon some of the topics I've discussed in my Escape Velocity video, as well as Chimeras of Meaning, so in case you haven't seen them yet, I'd recommend you watch them first, and there'll be links in the description box for those. Years ago, the late Stephen Jay Gould coined the term evolutionary spandrel. In architecture, a spandrel is the space between two arches in a structure. The term in biology, however, is something different and represents a characteristic or feature that is a byproduct of an adaptive feature without any adaptive value of its own. For example, many of you might be familiar with the famous Russian silver foxes that were bred for the singular trait of tameness, with the result that their phenotypical features changed as well, becoming more neotenous or dog-like the further the tame generations were bred. The dog-like features could be described as biological spandrels on top of the singular adaptive trait of tameness that they were bred for. Also interesting for the fact that behavioral traits selected for led to morphological changes. Likewise, large brain development in humans was likely an adaptive feature that was selected for repeatedly over many generations as an aid in survival, allowing for improved tool-making techniques as well as hunting strategies that improve survival chances and thus reproductive chances. But alongside the adaptive value of having bigger brains for survival and reproduction, there are almost certainly related evolutionary spandrels that arose from those bigger brains. Human language, at least theoretically, may be considered one of these spandrels, which only later became adaptive in that it sprung up from larger brain development, but its adaptive value was likely the result of it being a spandrel of larger brains. This process is referred to is referred to as ex-adaptation. Gould himself explained this in an article called The Ex-Adaptive Excellence of Spandrels as a Term and Prototype. Quote, The human brain may have reached its current size by ordinary adaptive processes key to specific benefits of more complex mentalities for our hunter-gatherer ancestors on the African savannas. But the implicit spandrels in an organ of such complexity must exceed the over-functional reasons for its origin. Now, that's important. I'll repeat that. But the implicit spandrels in an organ of such complexity must exceed the overt functional reasons for its origin. Just consider the obvious analogy to much less powerful computers. I may buy my home computer only for word processing and keeping the family spreadsheet, but the machine, by virtue of its requisite internal complexity, can also perform computational tasks exceeding, by orders of magnitude, the items of my original intentions, the primary adaptations, if you will, in purchasing the device. By way of this illustration, any cognitive feat or ability to perform cognitively outside of requisite survival and reproduction can be considered a spandrel, which may or may not have ex-adaptive value. Consider mathematics, or rather the capacity to comprehend and apply mathematics. Clearly, any human comprehension of mathematics is a spandrel as it relates to human brain development, because large brains were not selected for on the basis of mathematical computation and comprehension, but the ex-adaptive value thereof has been seized upon by human beings, allowing them to use mathematics for myriad tasks such as the construction of aircraft, buildings, as well as the production of mobile phones, computers, and a host of other things that characterize modernity and civilization in itself. In this way, a spandrel of brain development has become useful in the extreme, in addition to qualifying as it being an ex-adaptive feature. Ex-adaptations are usually categorized along two lines, one being an evolved feature that had been selected for because of its adaptive advantage in a particular respect, with a very prominent example being bird feathers. They evolved for the purposes of thermal regulation, which then later assumed a different adaptive role, which in the case of birds, is using those thermal regulatory feathers for the purposes of flight. 
This is termed co-opted adaptation because the origini original primary adaptive feature has been taken over by another one. In the case of humans, the beneficial effects of having larger brains, which allow humans to understand abstract concepts and quant consequently manipulate the world via those concepts, physics, chemistry, mathematics, are pure spandrels in that the brain did not develop for a specific purpose, such as thermal regulation, but possess multiple features, none of which was co-opted for a specific new feature. The human brain and its byproducts can thus be seen as a, a layer of spandrels upon spandrels, which lead to a particular cognitive spandrel I wish to talk about now at length. Not every spandrel has a clear-cut x-adaptive value. And the cognitive spandrel I want to address now is one that runs to conflict with other cognitive spandrels in that it has x-adaptive value, but also creates a conflict between our potential for reason and rationality and our willingness to bypass that potential in favor of other inclinations we possess that run counter to it, something that I will discuss at length later. Just as the ability to understand and apply mathematics is a useful cognitive spandrel, so too is our seeming unique awareness of our mortal status, what I term death awareness, more commonly referred to as mortality salience. No other animal, at least no other animal we're aware of, is cognizant of its forthcoming termination, as is the human ape, and consequently no other animals develop the panoply of cognitive tricks and mental gymnastics in an effort to circumvent uncertainty and ineluctability. And this has been scrutinized extensively by psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists, in an attempt to better understand a reaction to death awareness and how we deal with it. It is important to remember throughout the discussion that death awareness has both conscious and subconscious underpinnings, in that one can momentarily or lengthily contemplate one's own mortality, only then to go for years with little conscious thought given to it, but with all the subconscious pins and triggers remaining ever-present and directing certain aspects of our behavior unbeknownst to us. How humans cope with this has been elaborated upon by something called TMT, or Terror Management Theory. Terror Management Theory is ultimately based upon the work of Ernst Becker in his signature book, The Denial of Death, where he argues that much, if not all, of human civilization, cultural tradition, and in particular religion, but also a host of other things such as national identity, politics, etc., are a large-scale defense me mechanism against death awareness and a reinforcement of self-importance and ego preservation, commonly referred to as self-esteem. Now, to be fair, I don't entirely agree with him, and I think this view is overly simplified and that it's a bit too expansive and all-encompassing, and particularly with respects to every aspect of civilization in its totality. But there's a solid core an accurate core of truth to it, and I want to expand upon, uh, whose tendrils do, in fact, seep into virtually every aspect of human life. Now, let's start this discussion with religion. Religion is probably the human ape's chief immortality project, or at least his most obvious one, in that it's ubiquitous, can be readily dissected as such a project in an overt manner, and remains largely ineradicable as a phenomenon amongst human beings. The world over, one constant theme is religion. Most, if not all, religions posit that there exists some hereafter that a soul, disembodied or otherwise, floats off death and persists. And in persisting, so too persists the mind or personality of the possessor of said soul. There's likely not a religion on earth that does not have some variation of this theme. Religion, in essence, has always sold the best product man could ever muster, namely immortality, and in years bygone, it was wholly believable a wholly believable product since alongside religion's chief product of immortality, it offered an explanatory mechanism for the workings of the world as well, and had no competition explaining the world until fairly recently. In this respect, religion was and is a failed science, and only lost ground to modern empirical science in recent times, but this secondary aspect as an explanatory mechanism is of little importance since its primary product and function remains as popular as ever. Which leads us to the next point. Factuality and religion are almost oxymoronic when conjoined. Whereas, on the other hand, fatuousness and religion seem bosom buddies of a like unparalleled. And yet neither the fatuousness of religion nor its factual or lack of factual content are the primary contributors to its continued existence. 
While some scientists might find it interesting and relevant to debate the factual and explanatory merits of religious claims, this was never the main selling point that religion has offered mankind. It does not matter how much evidence is adduced and amassed in modern science that stands in direct contradiction to religious claims, because religious persuasion has almost nothing to do with evidentiary claims about the universe or descriptive models of the world. And when such claims and models do arise, they are merely a side project engaged in to buffer and support the immortality project that is its chief undertaking. And this is far too often overlooked by atheists and anti-theists alike. And this is why the so-called atheist movement has and always will fail in its endeavors, at least on a large scale. Atheism, which, as Girl Writes What pointed out in her video, Atheists, you asked for it, is little more than a non-belief in deities, based on a lack of evidence, and admittedly, and I'm here in complete agreement with Girl Writes What, most people involved in the so-called atheist movement supplement their atheism with far too many intellectual prosthetics, with the end result being the atheism plus controversy, among other things, and I'll have more to say on that later. Recall that religion sells the best product out there, immortality. Atheism, by contrast, peddles the worst product out there, death. All the evidence in the world presented in favor of an atheistic cosmogony and cosmology will not be sufficient because the atheist product carries with it what is probably the lowest selling point of anything available to man, annihilation, death, the end of everything. And not just any death, a complete and thorough termination of existence with no return thence thereafter. And one would be hard-pressed to receive any payment for, at all for such wares. Atheists, inasmuch as they congregate around the term atheism as if it were some coherent set of organizational principles, are essentially merchants of death. And yes, I'm borrowing the term from economics. And there's no way past that. To those who might counter this by claiming that atheism, and I'm speaking primarily of the mass movement, promotes positivity through life affirmation and denial of a hell-bent afterlife, this is not what comes out to the majority of consumers buying your product. And indeed, if you've watched my video entitled The Chimeras of Meaning, there is a relationship between the Immortality Project and the quest for absolute meaning, both of which are offered up in abundance by most religions. And intimately tied to any form of immortality project is the concept of what I prefer to call ego affirmation, usually referred to as self-esteem, where self-esteem is defined by two components, the first being the validity of a particular worldview, and this worldview can run the range from a religious one to a conspiratorial Alex Jonesian one, and the second being the degree to which one lives in concert with that worldview, essentially one's faithfulness to its tenets. And here it's critical to note that nowhere in the definition of ego affirmation does accuracy or truth fit, at least in an objective factual sense. Valid is used here not in a logical sense, but it's an original etymological sense, as it originally stems from the Latin verb valere, meaning to be strong. A strength does not imply truth in terms of terror management theory and ego affirmation. Valid simply implies the potency of a particular belief system with respects to the ability to feed and preserve the ego, as well as one's devotion to the tenets of that system. This is not to say that ego affirmation systems and the followers of such systems, such as Christianity, Marxism, take your pick, make no truth claims. They do indeed. Any belief system, whatever its particulars, will inevitably make some claim about the world or universe that can be factually accounted for or not. But the distinction to be made here is that when such claims found are on a factual basis, they will be made and fitted such as to conform to the respective belief system, because the validity of that system depends upon its ability to deflect opposing claims, which in turn preserves the primary objective of that belief system, namely preservation of the ego. And I should expand on what I mean by deflection. Uh, by this, I do not mean countering arguments with the adduction of counter-evidence, since the prime motivation of the devotee of any ego-invested belief system will be the sustentation of the system, not because the system is true, whatever the co coincidental veracity of the system might be, but the prevention of a corrosion of said belief system, which is tantamount to a corrosion of the self, i.e. the ego that has invested so much time into that system. 
One prominent example of this is in the so-called manosphere is that long-haired fellow from Wales, from whom we have seen time and again, one non-sequitur after the other, ad hominem, as well as a proliferation of genetic fallacies committed in an effort to deflect counterpoints and arguments presented against his worldview. And in particular, in this particular person's case, it's demonstrable that his worldview takes priority over evidence and objective criteria. Because we can see just how much ego is invested in this belief system of left-right politics. Because any counterpoint, be it related to politics or something as unrelated as GMOs, will be dismissed as the leftist collectivist conspiracy and the person supplying the counterpoint will be attacked because he stands in disagreement with the long-haired fellow. The enemy will be branded, maligned, and named collectivist, which is some summary of evil in this man's world. Never mind that it has never been defined, but definition is another issue entirely, and once again irrelevant to the purpose of ideology. And this leads us to another element in the equation of ego affirmation and belief, which is to say, a critical part of any belief system is to defend it against the infidels, which can be members of another religion, or in the case of politics, the endless left-right circus that enthuses so many something I refer to as the Manichaean dichotomization, whereby deviation from the beliefs of the investors in that particular system are demonized, thereby creating a belief polarity. Now, for clarification, Mani, the progenitor originator of Man Manichaeanism, was an Iranian prophet of the 3rd century AD, whose teachings were characterized by the absolute duality of the universe, and they di dichotomized the world into a place of light and darkness, each line on the opposite end of the scale, it went to the term and the reason for Manichaean dichotomization. And of course, we see this paradigm in numerous other religions, political systems, and even sports teams, so it begs the question as to what this is about. Now, I've talked about uh, tribalism at length in the past before, but as yet, it's not, I've never really addressed its psychological origins, and that's something I want to remedy right now. Manichaean dichotomization is simply a social polarization process, the creation of team A and B, where each team is ostensibly diametrically opposed to the other, a perfect example of this being American right-left politics. But where does this come from? Recall that belief system investment is directly tied to ego preservation. The more investment, the higher the stakes are for people who have invested a great deal in that particular ideology or credo. A disintegration of that belief system would lead to a disintegration of the self, an annulment of self-esteem, and nearing to a more conscious form of mortality salience, which is why it is so important that everything be part of that worldview or opposed to it. Inasmuch as something is opposed to it, such as political ideology that pro proffers a different view on things, or a religion with a different metaphysical claim, you know, Jesus is the son of God versus uh, he's merely a prophet, Allah Islam, that system is an enemy and a threat that, to the system and person holding a different view, and consequently, so are the adherents of the different system. All forms of strong tribalism follow this core model of identity slash ego sustentation and validation where encounters with the other, and that's in air quotes, invariably lead to this Manichaean dichotomization and polarization effect I've discussed. This expands upon tribal organizations as merely a survival mechanism in a physical sense and explains its psychological underpinnings as well. The Immortality Project is effectively the ego project, and tribal adherence and or ideological loyalty are outcroppings of the need to feel important, or in terms of Manichaean dichotomization, create an epic duality out of reality, and something that Ernst Becker had discussed at length in his work, The Denial of Death which he had called the Hero Project, the making of the epic out of the mundane. And I'm going to quote him here. It does not matter whether the cultural hero system is, frankly, magical, religious, and primitive, or secular, scientific, and civilized. It is still a mythical hero system in which people serve in order to learn, of, earn a feeling of primary value, value, of cosmic specialness, of ultimate usefulness to creation, of unshakable meaning. And here we turn back to the chimeras of meaning that we have fashioned for ourselves in a universe devoid of absolute meaning. But in this context, it is doubly important because as we have seen, the quest for meaning in whatever form, but in particular in the form of complex beliefs and ideologies, is simply a need to preserve the ego at all costs. 
and the costs are indeed high, because more often than not, reason and rationality are sacrificed at the altar of these gods of ego. Because as it turns out, ego preservation for most human beings trumps rationality. And I want to return to that, but for now I want to explore the evolutionary background of terror management and death anxiety. Recall that with the development of larger brains, there arose various spandrels as a byproduct of this, a death awareness being one that concerns us here, but many of the cognitive spandrels that arose from this larger brain are hard to place in the context of survival and reproduction. What I mean by this is that the body has fixed reactions to certain events in terms of its neurochemistry, regardless of the providence of those reactions, which is to say, encountering a hungry cave lion and experiencing emotion, emotional duress, while substantively very different, will often produce identical neurochemical reactions in the body. And I want to return to this shortly, but bear in mind, bear this in mind as I proceed. Death awareness by itself can be considered a spandrel with neither adaptive nor exadaptive value, but its inception and presence demanded coping mechanisms to deal with it, with the various immortality projects I've mentioned being examples of this. But what happens when coping mechanisms fail, or more specifically, come under threat by way of refutation or personal revelation? To understand this, we must first delve into the basics of, bio of the biochemistry of fight-or-flight reactions. When the body is in a state of fear, panic, or anxiety, the adrenal cortex releases steroid hormones, specifically the steroid hormones called, glu called glucocorticoids, with cortisol being the most prominent one. Corticosteroids have a number of functions, including metabolic regulation, immune response, and stress response, with the last function being most relevant to the discussion at hand. And cortisol helps to manage stress by regulating blood pressure, promoting gluconeogenesis, which is the synthesis of glucose for energy usage from amino acids, uh, glycerol and pyru pyruvate, and blocks inflammation as well, all of which are essential in high-stress situations, such as our counter with the cave lion. Now, all things considered, assuming you have either bested the cave lion or success successfully fled from it, the body, with its desire for homeostasis, reduces cortisol production levels and its effects with it until the next stressful encounter when once again, it's necessitated. Recall now that I had mentioned earlier that the body has fixed reactions to events independent of the providence of those events. Enter now the cognitive spandrel of mortality salience, the high related anxiety, as well as general stress in the abstract sense, as opposed to the stress of encountering a cave lion, physical stress. These types of stressors are almost certainly unique to humans because our brains with their capacity for advanced cognition allow for them. And no other animal on earth concerns itself with the long-term ramifications of a real estate investment, the stock market, or a life-deciding ex examination, or any other scenario without immediate danger. But because the body only has one regulatory mechanism for dealing with stress and is indifferent to the source of the stress, the same processes that come into play with the cave lion also come into play when you are worried about being laid off from work or failing the exam, with a critical difference being that the cave lion encounter is temporary. But your concerns about being laid off from work or failing are constant. Anxiety is, after all, just constant stress. And with constant stress come constantly elevated levels of corticosteroids with all the attendant effects, including the bad effects of long-term cortisol production, such as fatigue, muscle wasting, weight gain, heart disease, depression, and a host of other ill effects. And now, there's even evidence to suggest that cortisol can kill off brain cells in the hippocampus, which is crucial to memory and knowledge retention. Interestingly enough, without our advanced cognitive capacity, we would not be able to envision problematic outcomes, be concerned about long-term plans not working out, or worry about any of the things that seem to characterize modern human civilization. Now, let us assume that the TMT hypothesis in its core or originated from Ernest Becker is true, namely that culture is a collection of attempts at meaning and significance in the face of mortality salience. Our best attempt to shrug off the conscious and unconscious terror of annihilation through the creation of sectors of meaning. And furthermore, most if not all attributions of importance to the things we do are intimately tied to the maintenance of our self-esteem, which itself is dependent on the existence of those sectors of meaning.
In light of this, what is truly fascinating is the sort of backfiring that has occurred with respect to our biological fight or flight mechanisms and our advanced civilization. We have overcome many of the dangers of the past, only to create our own nigh-permanent state of danger in the form of the many types of daily stress we are exposed to and create for ourselves, and be they worrying about finances, rush hour, or anything else, whatever we have accomplished is in part offset by the slow death we inflict upon ourselves within modern civilization, as contrasted with the quick deaths of the past, a victim of tooth and claw and spear. Our own desire to ward off such occurrences led to the transition from sudden fright to permanent anxiety that could have only had its inception, inception in an animal of higher cognitive function. We can, quite literally, kill ourselves with thought, a feat that cannot be matched by any other animal on the planet. To combat this, we require and have created ever greater simulations of meaning, for the meaning of modernity is the great distraction. With nearly endless means of entertainment, distractions in the world and on the internet, we have attempted to create a new smokescreen, a new panacea to coat our fear-laden minds with. Becker was right. Religion or Iron Man 3, these are all dreams meant to steal away the fright we feel, both consciously and subconsciously. But ultimately, we cannot escape our own nature by creating things whose very own wellspring is that nature. And this is speculative on my part, but I suspect the tenacity with which we hold on to our core beliefs, irrespective of their veridical content, beyond the need to maintain self-esteem, ego, might be related to a desire to avoid not just possible damage to the ego, but the negative physiological effects that ensue when confronted with stress, in particular a stress such as the repudiation of lifelong held beliefs and more particularly when they're attached to income and survival, such as the case with a politician, a religious leader, or an internet pundit promulgating his political faith. All this gives rise to the question of whether a man, whether or not man can indeed be rational at all. When the stakes are so high, and much of what he does is indicative not of a reasoned being, but a fear-corroded ape that will pound his chest to the last in an effort to ward off the fear, but never once give pause to why it, does it, why it does so so reflexively. But more on this later. I would now like to talk about the differences between the sexes with respect to reason, rationality, and ego affirmation. Uh, something of a tangent, but an important one nonetheless. There are, of course, significant neurological differences between men and women. And that would be an interesting topic in and of itself, but for the purposes of this discussion, I would like to focus on how differing reproductive roles have led to differentiated outcomes in regards to notions of religion, superstition, rational discourse, and discussion. To understand how and why men and women take different approaches to belief and maintenance of belief, it's important to go back to the most fundamental aspect of all organisms, which is the drive to reproduce copies of its genes. And in sexually dimorphic species, such as humans, there will be different strategies to achieving this depending on the sex of the achiever. It might seem far-fetched to claim that differing reproductive strategies can lead to distinguishable cognitive strategies, but we must think of much of what, en what's, what has ended up being our cognitive makeup as effectively spandrel stuff. For a cognitively advanced animals such as Homo sapiens, spillover from differing means and approaches to reproduction based on sex is just par for the course. Specifically, the aspect I wish to focus in on is uh, the male willingness to undertake a risk versus female desire for security and the concomitant aversion to risk-taking that that desire for security accompanies. The London School of Economics evolutionary psychologist Satoshi Kanawaza explains the basis of this. Quote, Women in virtually every society and culture are more religious than men, and the empirical evidence suggests that the reason is not gender socialization. So what explains the higher level of religiosity among women? The sex difference in religiosity falls directly from the evolutionary psychological theory of the origin of religious beliefs that I pre present in earlier posts and the sex difference in risk-taking. You'll recall that the evolutionary origins of religiosity are in risk management. It is less risky to over-infer agency and hence be susceptible to religious beliefs than to under-infer agency and get killed by enemies, predators when you least expect them. It is an error management strategy to minimize the total costs of errors by predisposing the human brain to commit more false positive errors 
of an inference than false negative errors when the former has less costly consequences than the latter. You'll also recall that women are inherently more risk-averse than men, but both because women benefit far less from taking risks given that they there is a limit on how many children women can have and that all women are more or less guaranteed to have some children in their lifetime, and because their offspring suffer if women are risk-seeking and get injured or die as a, as a result. This is why men are much more criminal and violent than women if men are more risk-seeking than women and if religion is an evolutionary means to minimize risk, then it naturally follows that women are more religious than men. Error management theory, developed by the evolutionary psychologist David Buss, fits in well with terror management theory. In fact, in many ways, they're partners in crime. As simply stated, error, evol evolutionary error management theory proposes that humans, males and females respectively, have developed cognitive biases to reduce and manage reproductive errors with two primary outcomes, false positives and false negatives. Usually these cognitive biases are limited to psychological readings of the opposite sex's intent, but as has often been the case, our reproductive biases spill over into other domains. Women have developed a cognitive bias towards false positive assessments and judgments because their outcome is quite simply less risky than dealing with a false negative judgment outcome, women being naturally less risk-happy than our men. And put in the simplest of terms, it's far safer to assume there is some divine power watching over you and your soul than it is to assume it that's not the case. And recall from earlier, not just the psychological consequences of stress, but the physiological ones. A damage to the ego and self-esteem can be life-threatening. So in this sense, women's natural cognitive biases shield them from potentially deleterious outcomes. This higher predilection to infer agency on the part of women when there is none, stretches across the palette of the supernatural available to us, ranging from astrology, tarot cards, fortune telling, you name it. An error management theory also explains, and this is now my own speculation supported by the above adduced evidence, the classic scenario of you know, quote unquote miscommunication between men and women in intimate relationships within the context of fighting. Women will often make statements along the lines of, Quote, unquote, it does not feel as if you are listening to me, whilst men simply lay out the facts. Factual discussion carries more risk than does feeling-based discussion, for the simple reason that such feeling-based such feeling -based discussion can be steered any which way one, one wants, and one cannot effectively be wrong. Whereas factually-based discussion carries with it the risk of just having the wrong facts on your side, in which case they're not facts, bearing misinformation. Error management theory tells us that it's simply safer to be guided by feelings rather than facts and deductions since feelings cannot be subjected to scrutiny and repudiation, whereas facts and argumentation can be. Terror management theory explains that by doing so, damage to self-esteem can be averted, which is linked to very real life, life or death perceptions. Feeling is less risky and a better preservative of the ego than is thinking objectively. Now, once again, going to dive into the realm of speculation, but I suspect that men's greater willingness to undertake risk spills over into the domain of personal reflection and mental illness. When men lapse into depression or other states of mental agony, they're less inclined to create false positive narratives simply because it makes them feel good, but rather they're more inclined to look at things objectively, leaving them without the kind of mental and emotional buffer that women possess that alongside social isolation, something women don't know. Women possess far more inclination to create false positives. This could then result in the far greater suicide success of men compared to women, because quite possibly men are less likely to paint a pretty or fictitious picture for the purposes of self-deception, merely to make themselves feel good. They look at the facts, and if such facts are sufficiently grim, this can lead to fatal consequences. Now, admittedly speculation, but I think there's some evidence to support this idea. The autism, the autism researcher Simon Baron Cohen has developed the empathized and systematizing theory by which people are cognitively assessed along the lines of whether their minds function uh, according to more empathizing or systematizing systems. The female mind is usually classed as more empathizing. Big surprise, the male mind as more systematizing. Also not a surprise. What, however, is interesting is how this manifests itself in the sexes. In the past, I've coined the term bore consensus to express the nigh uniformity of opinion and agreement when groups of women are among themselves. 
particularly in areas of public discourse. The empathizing mind is less interested in objective facts and more interested in social harmony. The systematizing mind has higher regard for facts as they pertain to systems or of functions in this world. This also lends credence to the idea that, regardless how it makes people feel, women on the whole are less objective than our men, and more importantly are less object- interested in objective truth than our men. Exceptions exist and will always exist, but our different evolutionary backgrounds have helped shape separate mental apparatus for the purposes of reproduction, which then result in spillover effects in other areas. An empathizing mind will be more inclined towards social harmony, getting along, etc., whilst a systematizing mind will be more inclined towards comprehension, creating things based on that comprehension. In prehistoric times, an empathizing system would have been useful for child-rearing, intrasexual socialization, cohesion and reducing social conflict, which is important to risk reduction, very important to women. A systematizing mind, on the other hand, would have been useful in developing hunting strategies, building essential structures such as uh, shelters, campfires, and in bouts of intrasexual male competition. Now, much of this explains why feminism is so successful and so seductive and so readily accepted by women, Feminism presents a fictitious, non-factual account of the world that offers comfort and self-esteem to those who buy into it, and feminism's blatant ignorance of historical and biological fact is also explained in as much as fact is of non-importance for the purpose of ideological maintenance, since ideologies exist, as has been discussed prior, not for factually accounting for the world, but for creating belief systems to ward off threats to the human psyche and ego, and what better way for women to do this than to create a system of eternal victimization, where penance can never be sufficiently be paid for by the sinners, and salvation from victimhood is forever unattainable for the victims. Now moving on to another topic. Now look at any poll or set of stats will show you that almost universally religious people are happier and more content than non-religious people. Now of course only a fool would take this as evidence for the veracity of religious claims and beliefs, but is nonetheless important to note. Happiness should now be correctly understood to be code for an intact and undamaged self-esteem. What is meant by religious people being happier is that they are better shielded from intellectual and ideological challenges to their well-being by dint of their faith, and that would be something that's absent in a non-believer. And this is yet another reason why atheists and so-called skeptics have so many obstacles in peddling the wares that they sell. Humans on the whole have not evolved to be rational per se, nor have they evolved to comprehend the world. Comprehension and rational activity are forced engagements requiring great willpower. Humans, of all sorts, would much rather act in concert with their evolved faculties in an effort to maintain their self-esteem and ego than go against them for the sake of objectivity, where objectivity is an ever-present threat to their well-being because being objective allows for the admission and acceptance of error, something ideology, religious or otherwise, is insulated against by both nature and design. It seems rather obvious that, despite all pretensions to the contrary, Even great scientists can fall afoul of ideological commitment to their own ideas where ego investment has been so great, contrasting evidence is turned away because it might dent their ego or threaten their livelihood. But this begs the question, can human beings truly be rational, and if so, what might that require? To the maintenance of both psychological and physical health, the preservation of the ego and related self-esteem seems to be inextricably bound, which is to say... Subconsciously, we all struggle to maintain our identities under the, under these constraints, and there appears to be little evidence that this can be done away with. The human ego shall remain, and there's no way around this, at least based on the evidence I've looked at. And this leaves human beings with one option, which would entail realigning the ego to something other than a coherent belief system. And by coherent, I don't mean factually accurate, but a organized set of principles. Any belief system, no matter its nature, origin, or area of application, will encompass some truth and some falsehood. Even the best thought-out systems will necessarily contain errors, which means that belief systems, as a, as a set of codified rules of thought and theories, must be done away with and discarded as belief systems. 
as belief systems, though not necessarily all the details, if the details are, in, in fact, factually accurate. In their place, we must realign the human ego to perceive, perceive the value in truth and lack of value in falsehood, which is to say that humans can learn to feed the ego by the pursuit of objective truth and reality, when in possession of incorrect information, this should serve only to motivate and ameliorate the incomplete state of knowledge, as correction will be better improve the ego and improve self-esteem. In this matter, human contentment can become linked not to what often amounts to arbitrary sets of beliefs about the world with literal relation to reality, but reality itself. Human passion, human struggle, the need to combat inner terror, all of this can be set in a new direction where rationality becomes the gold standard for human contentment, and a seeking of objective truth and expansion of legitimate knowledge becomes the fuel for that direction. One must consider the consequences of the primitive mind urges by which we are beset upon. Tribalism, political ideologies, religious crusades, and all the nasty consequences of these things that have been recorded in history. The stakes are that high. Think of the countless lives that might have been saved had man under undergone a transformation of mind, and the risk still runs high today, as our blighted past continues to be and shall remain a clear and ever-present danger to human well-being and human life, and the planet on the whole. I believe change is theoretically possible, but highly, highly unlikely. I know all too well the human penchant to seek after that which feels good, at the cost of objective understanding. And indeed, I've had many conversations with many of my fellow apes on many an occasion, each of them revealing to me that they think truth is less important than happiness. Read Ego. For this reason, a realignment of ego affirmation to objective facts and truth seems unfeasible at best, because the other, more traditional paths to this end are far easier to walk. It is a question of the road not taken, of what could be attained if only for a moment we shift our gate to walk the path not trodden, and in doing so, perhaps realize how much we have lost by blindly following the guttural urges of our past and printed minds, and by falsely believing such urges to be claimants to a throne of joy. What wonders could we have achieved had we railed against the well-trodden path? How much further could we have come? These are questions I ask myself every day knowing they will forever remain my speculation. If we cannot shed the ego for the sake of reason, we must realign it to reason. Of course, none of this entails constantly having accurate factual information at our disposal, something that is quite literally impossible. But rather, it means that we betake ourselves on a quest to seek that which is true and factual without being blinded or hindered by ideological shackles of any sort, whatever their seductive power something very few can lay claim to doing. And given human inclinations and our millennia-old habits and still far older instincts, I can predict with fair confidence that this shall never pass. And it is for this reason that man shall forever remain the contented irrationalist. In this sense, this video is a very much a glimpse of what might have been, but will never be. Thanks for watching my video. If you like these, sor these sorts of videos, these kinds of videos of detailed content, please consider making a donation because they help a great, great deal in the production of these kinds of detailed, uh, complex videos. Uh, there are links below to all the, pretty much all the things that I mentioned. Uh, if you want to delve more into the topics I mentioned, be it uh, terror management theory, error management theory, false positives, whatever, Links are all below, as well as links to my older videos. Everyone, thanks for watching, and take care. Bye-bye.